they do a great job. Like I said, this is one of the best things for manufacturing in Texas. So if you're scared of a lot of the stuff that I just talked about previously, that it may be, you know, the Auto Privilege Act may be your getting out of finding a free card in a sense. You know, you do all the things you're supposed to do. So I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you. All right. Again, my name is Mark Dela Cruz. I'm uh, the Air Section Manager in the Enforcement Division here in Austin. Um, so, as part of the enforcement, we deal a lot with air violations, either not having the right authorizations, not complying with those authorizations. We got specific requirements in those. Um, and then my counterparts do water and waste. Um, so, if you have any waste, uh, tires, used oil, things of that sort, um, they're the ones that regulate that and do the enforcement on, on those pieces. Um, so, but my other hat is to do the Audit Privilege Act program. So, kind of go through that. So, here's the outline. We're going to talk about the guides. We're talking about immunity, uh, notice of audit, request for um, request for extensions, and disclosure of violations. Um, so, under the Audit Privilege Act, just to get you an idea. When you come to enforcement, you're going to get an administrative penalty, you're going to get an agreed order, um, and it's going to come with some corrective actions. It will like spell out what the violations are, how we came up with those penalties, and what the corrective actions are to come back into compliance. In order to avoid that, the best option that we have in the state is the Audit Privilege Act, which grants immunity for administrative and civil penalties, as long as you do what you need to be doing uh, to come back into so as far as the guide goes, uh, we've got additional information. If you go to our main website, um, just type in RG173. Um, it's a very short document. The last time it was revised was back in 2013. Um, but we're looking to revise it lately with the current changes that we have currently. Within the guide, we've got what we call the historical background. Um, and it's got guidance for all these things. Um, as well as an appendix of the Audit Privilege Act and the appendices of some model correspondence. Um, so we're not leaving you uh, uh, with no information. It, it pretty much tells you what you need to do, how to submit the documents, and if there's any issues, we'll, we'll call you and kind of help you out through the process. As far as the historical background goes, back in 95 in the 74th legislature, they passed the Audit Privilege Act. Um, so it provides limited immunity um, to and basically, you, you tell us what the violations are, you fix it within a reasonable amount of time, and you get um, immunity from those violations. Um, just like many things, when the legislature passes these things, sometimes there's tweaks. So we got a bunch of comments from the EPA, because about the same time frame, we're going through what we call a counterpart review or for major sources within the state. So we had to make some tweaks, and then they came back in 97, adjusted those, uh, that language modified the scope of the audit privilege and immunity. Um, and then ever since then, it, it was pretty much smooth sailing until 2013 when they came up with a good idea was, well, what if I'm gonna buy a facility? Can I prevail myself to that immunity? So they added some additional language for prospective buyers. Um, and then we'll go further into that language. And then in 2017, they made a change to codify it from uh, where it was into the health and safety code under chapter uh, 1101. Um, as far as the guidance goes, it's giving you guidance as far as the notice of audit, request for extensions, and disclosure of violations. The Audit Privilege Act also provides guidance for privilege and audit privilege act. Um, so as long as you're doing what you're doing um, and it's not a criminal intent, then you're going to prevail yourself to some um, audit privilege. And then for immunity, uh, again, as far as your, if you do the notices, you submit it to the disclosures and correct it within a reasonable amount of time, you're going to get immunity from administrative and, and civil penalties. And then it's got a section for questions and answers, um, and as well as some model examples, like I said. So as far as immunity goes, it's under uh, section 1101.151. Uh, again, what you get is you have to disclose, you have to submit a voluntary disclosure. Um, and within it, you're telling us what the violations are and what you're going to do to fix it, and you fix it within a reasonable amount of time. Um, under the notice of audit, which is covered under section 1101.154, you have to specify what you're being looking at, um, how long it's going to take you, when it's going to begin, uh, and the general scope of the audit. So you can break it up 
you could go, well, I want to look at the whole site. If, it's, it's, if you have a small facility, you can look at the whole site. Or you can break it out by media. You can go air, water, and waste. Um, or there's a specific um, subpart or a uh, federal rule that you want to specifically look at. You can do that as well. Um, and then you can submit uh, that notice of audit to our um, deputy director here in Austin. And what we normally add is additional information to kind of give us that um, in order to track your information. Because we've got about 4,000 audits going on at any time throughout, throughout the year. Um, so we want to know specifically who's doing the audit, what are they looking at, what's the fiscal location. Um, we do a lot, especially with the oil and gas industry out in uh, West Texas um, and, and the recent shells and then fracking and all, and all that. So there's a lot of leases out there. So we want to be specific of where you're looking at uh, so that we can pinpoint who we're dealing with and, and, uh, and there's no surprises. Because again, we want to make sure that you're getting immunity if it, if it really, uh, if you meet those requirements. And describe the, what you're looking at, the time and date of the initiation of the audit, and the general scope. So here's a model letter. Um, oops, there we go. So here's the name. Um, so I think everything in the yellow is all that is required. Um, so it's telling us what they're going to be looking at, when they're going to begin, um, and the scope, looking at all that. And then the blue is all the uh, additional information. Um, so again, we kind of try to give you all the information so you can submit a, a proper notice. Uh, if there's any issues, we'll contact you. Um, we're not going to deny the immunity. We're going to give you an opportunity to fix it and resubmit. Um, and then the audit has to be done um, within six months unless an extension is granted. So as I mentioned before, with the pre-acquisition audit, there's no requirement to do the notice uh, because you're doing the audit before you actually own the facility. And then if you want to continue the audit right in here, you'll have to give us notice within 45 days of the acquisition date um, and let us know that you're you just acquire the facility, um, kind of same things as the original notice of audit, and then uh, you give us a certification statement, which contains basically these four bullets. Um, you're letting us know that you were not part of the, the violations that occurred or, or, or occurred or that were done by the previous owner, and you had no connection with the prior owner. So it's, it's all new to you, you're finding these things, um, and then if you find those violations, you let us know. So here's an idea of the number of notice audits we, we receive per year. Um, so 2020 is, that's just the data all the way up to September. Our fiscal year is run from September 1 to August 31st. Um, so that's just one month's worth of data so far. Um, but as you can see, it was a little decline and then it, it spiked right back up in 2016. Um, usually, I would say the numbers kind of changed, especially with the oil and gas industry because there was a lot, the boom was coming back. Um, so facilities were changing hands, um, so that's kind of a, the big spike, and then uh, it kind of tapered down and it, it went back up. Some of the problems that we see with the uh, notice of audits is the postmark date. So again, the whole intent is to give us notification prior to commencing the audit. So if you date the letter to the court today, um, you want to make sure it your audit doesn't commence for a couple days later. So that way we get the notice or it's dated and your commencement is a little bit later. Um, we have some entities that kind of put it on the same day. Uh, the only problem with that is if it's not put in the mail before you commence the audit, then that we run that risk of not giving us prior notice to the commencement. Uh, you always have to be careful because sometimes um, even though it, it may be timely, you've got the date today and your commencement in a couple days later, it's got to be put in the mail. Um, we've run into some issues where it wasn't put in the mail for a couple days uh, and the audit commenced. So that's what you have to do. Really make sure it gets in the mail. Um, and then the scope is within our rules and regulations. So we've got um, our administrative code, which contains a lot of our regulations, as well as some EPA rules that we're delegated enforcement for. 
Uh, and you let us know who you're, who you're going to be looking at. Um, as far as privilege and confidentiality, under the Audit Privilege Act, it's all open record. So anything we receive, and if it's marked uh, privileged or confidential, we will respond to that, letting you know um, that these are open record documents, and we'll file them as such. Um, but that is, even though it, the documents may be marked that way, you're not going to be denied immunity just because of that. And for instance, uh, as I mentioned before, no, uh, the self-audit investigation is usually a six-month period unless you give us a good reason why you need another month uh, or a couple more months. We usually don't go greater than five months um, because it's six months we think is sufficient. Um, but another five months you can deal with, especially if you're dealing with a lot of rules and regulations. Um, things why people are asking for extension is usually because of uh, management turnover or maybe the whoever they're dealing with left and now you have to get somebody else. So just kind of give us a reason and then we'll kind of work with you from there. Uh, those requests are also submitted to our deputy director. Um, and things just kind of make, so that way you're not denied uh, on the request. We want to make sure that they get submitted timely. So if you're coming up uh, at least a week or two before the six month period ends, submit that request. Um, the sooner we get it, the better. Um, because if we don't get the request until after the six months is over, then there's a possibility we can get denied because we probably found some violations in between. Um, we may not be able to grant immunity for those. So disclosure violations. Uh, this is the other very critical part. Um, so a person who makes a voluntary disclosure um, is immune from administrative civil penalties as long as they provide their voluntary disclosure. And this is, we've got a couple bullets talking about the voluntary disclosure. Um, the critical, or I guess some of the more critical ones, is disclose promptly upon discovery. And the reason we say that is because if you, if you do your audit, you've already spent about six months into it, and you find some violations and you want to gather them all up and wait to the very end until you're done. Um, the only problem with that is if there's a complaint investigation which is unannounced, we come to the site and investigate, we find the same violations <coughs> if they weren't disclosed, but we can't grant those immunities because the reason we found those. Um, so that's kind of why we say prompt upon discovery. Um, to us, it doesn't matter if you um, give us one disclosure or 100. We want to make sure that you're granted immunity. So the more, uh, if you want to do it by week or by day, whatever works best for you guys, um, do do that. We highly recommend that you disclose those violations so that way you're granted the immunity. Um, and they have to be submitted via certified mail. Unfortunately, this is a rule that was written a long, long time ago, and now there's multiple ways to get mail delivered, email, um, UPS, FedEx, um, all those carriers, uh, unfortunately it's written in the rule that it has to be certified mail. Um, and until that gets changed, we've, we've got to comply with the rule. Um, and then like I said, if, if the, vi the violation was not initiated or um, independently detected by a regulatory agency such as ourselves or EPA, um, then you could disclose those violations. And the violations are found out as you're doing your uh, self-audit investigation. They're not something that you knew about and then you want to do a, a notice of audit and disclose because um, you have prior knowledge. Um, there has to be violations you found during your six month evaluation. And then you, uh, whatever violations you find, you're fixing them within a reasonable amount of time. So a lot of times it's say like a open container. Um, you find it, you disclose it, but we're not expecting you to fix that within a, a couple months or a couple weeks. Uh, if you see an open container, put the lid on. Do what you need to do to come back in compliance and then put it on your disclosure and it's already fixed. Because um, as soon as we uh, know that the violations are fixed, then we're able to grant immunity for that specific violation. And if you've got many more to disclose, then we'll handle those depending on the corrective action schedule. person making a disclosure co-ops with regulators and agencies. So if we have any questions about certain violations or certain rule sites that you 
identify. We understand that you may not know all the, the rules, uh, be as familiar as we are, um, but if you give, give us a really good idea of what the rule is um, and the brief description, then we can match it up and then kind of help you out and walk you through that process. Um, and as long as the violation does not result in injury or imminent uh, risk to human health or the environment. So if you got a big spill uh, and people got sick or fish spill and things like that, we may not be granted immunity for those violations, but we do want to make sure that those violations get fixed. Um, as far as the voluntary uh, disclosure, it needs to contain these things. Again, it's to match it up with the notice of audit that was submitted earlier, uh, and then we're able to uh, identify what the violations are, grant immunity for the period of time, just in case uh, the regional <coughs> staff come out or EPA comes out. If they're looking, well, what happened two years ago, if you're in the audit, we can kind of go through that umbrella and grant you immunity for that period of time. Uh, but once the corrective action is done, then that's another violation which may not be covered under the audit. And here's an example of the disclosure, kind of giving us, um, here's the violation description, letting us know what it is, uh, applicable rule citations, when you discovered it. And this is kind of real, real key to us, because we're at least we're trying to make sure it matches up with that notice of audit when you commence and when that six period ends. As long as this date falls within there, then we, we, we're taking your word that it was discovered during that period of time. Um, and the violation could have started a long time ago, uh, prior to commencing the audit, but it's kind of given us an, uh, and this kind of sets up the period of, uh, the period of non-compliance. Usually what we'll do is grant you immunity all the way back to that period of time, um, and then all the way up to the corrective action date. Um, so if you've got authorizations that you not when you come through the state, sometimes the, the permitting action may take a little time. So we will work with you. Uh, as long as you submit the registration or the authorization applications in a timely manner, um, and then we'll kind of work with you and, and kind of put you on a, a specific schedule to come back and and as long as you're pursuing that with due diligence, then we'll continue granting that immunity until the authorization is issued. Uh, disclosure of pre-acquisition violations. So again, um, if you're looking to acquire a facility, this is kind of like buying a used car. A used car. You want to drive it, take it to a mechanic, get the tires, kind of do all that. Make sure you want you're getting a good investment. So that's kind of the same thing here. If you're looking to buy another or acquire another facility, you want to see what they have or what's wrong. So you you look at it, kind of set, you know, send your staff out there that may be familiar with those kinds of process and kind of do a walkthrough and see if any violations you have. Um, and then once you acquire it, you, those violations that you know of off the hand, you can disclose those and, grant, and be granted immunity and fix them after you acquire them. But the big thing here is uh, if you do acquire it and want to get protection, you want to get submit that notice within uh, 45 days of the acquisition date. Um, and then you, if you want to continue it, it's kind of going back to that original pre-acquisition notice. Um, on the same letter, you can just submit one letter, put the disclosure violations in here, as well as the certification statement, and um, make a request to extend the audit for another six months. It's the same uh, certification statement that was the pre-acquisition for a notice of audit. Um, same things, um, if you're not part of the corporation that was had the problem, um, and you're gonna do your best to, to fix them as quickly as you can. As far as the number of disclosures we received, um, again, it's, this is all the way up to end of September, so it's not that many. Um, and it kind of spiked up and went back down. I would say on here, um, we probably don't have as many disclosure violations only because um, there's what they were finding. Because uh, back in here, we in 2013, we had a real big spike. So there was a lot of oil and gas industries, uh, a lot of violations that we found. Uh, facilities were constructed without the proper authorization not being maintained the way they should have been. So a lot of things got fixed. Um, and now as, as they changed hands, they had some violations, but not as much. Um, 
and then we had the big disclosure in 2017 they kind of took us down again we're, we're kind of seeing that as there's a lot of people doing audits but they're not finding a lot of violations which is a good thing and most common things that we kind of see is uh, no affirmative assertion that there is a violation um, what we normally see is oh we, we've got an issue or we have a potential violation or we found this but what we really need uh, in order to be granted immunity is to let us know it is a violation. We, it's an affirmative assertion you have a violation and you're going to fix it. Because um, you can't really break the law unless you break it simple, uh, basically. So, um, so if we do see that, again, we'll let you know um, and give you an opportunity to fix it. Uh, if you fix it, then we'll continually grant you the immunity until you fix the violation. Um, on, and on the other hand, if you don't fix it, then we'll refer that matter to the regional office so they can investigate. Um, violations not clearly described. Um, say, for example, one of our air rules is um, 36 Administrative Code 116-115C, which says comply with your permit. Well, if you tell it that, then we don't know exactly what you're not complying with, specifically with your permit. So we kind of want to be specific uh, just in case a regional investigation comes out um, and they cite you for not maintaining records. Well, if that's what you found, then we want to make sure it matches. So that way we can grant immunity. Uh, violation start date, again, as I mentioned, it's, it's very critical so that way we can know when to grant immunity uh, and that you found the violation within that six month period. Things, uh, some rules that we don't have, delegate enforcement authority from general land office, um, some EPA rules. Those are still programs that um, EPA still has, they're the ones that will do the investigation, so we are no good in enforcement and we don't have the powers to investigate those types, those specific rules and then uh, do enforcement actions on. And here's some more city permits, railroad commission jurisdiction, DPS. Those are things we don't have jurisdictional control for. And here's some other EPA programs we don't have uh, control of. But again, if, if you disclose those violations, um, we'll let you know that we don't have the delegated enforcement authority for these. There's nothing wrong with you fixing them um, and coming back into compliance with those rules. We just cannot grant immunity for them. Uh, here's some other federal rules we don't have enforcement authority for. And as a summary, um, so ideally, notice of audit, you get it in. Um, and then disclose those violations and correct it within a reasonable amount of time. Um, as long as you do those things, then you will grant you immunity from administrative civil penalties. Um, and then all that information, if you have a regular entity reference number, an RN number and a customer number, um, we will have that information within our databases in, the, in the CCP. Um, and what we can do is when you run a compliance history, it'll show your, all your number of audit uh, that you submitted within the last five years and any disclosures, uh, and you'll be granted immunity. It'll show up in your compliance history, you get some positive points in your compliance history. If you don't have any of those identification numbers, that doesn't prevail you from conducting an audit, but um, you just don't get the compliance history. You still can uh, get the uh, immunity from administrative civil penalties. Um, and again, if you don't have that RN and CN relationship in uh, Central Registry's database, um, and there happens to be another investigation that's popped up, one will be issued at that point. Um, and as long as the RN and CN match, then those uh, past history notes of audits and disclosures sh should show up on your Um, as far as the audit, we've got four staff that are dedicated to reviewing all the correspondence that comes in, plus one uh, litigation attorney. Um, so if you have any questions, kind of break it down on the first letter of the company name. Um, so we kind of split, it up, split up the workload so that way one person is not working more than anybody else. Any questions?
regulations and bind them. Don't wait to the end of that six months and do them all at one time. We had the client, we set an audit for them, gave them the NOD, Here, here's your list. So they sat on it. We'll get to it, kind of a thing. The guy, the, the, the manager was literally at the post office sending it when TCQ showed up because it was, about, it was, it was a complaint that was made. So they got out of it because he, he came back and said, yeah, here, I just sent it off. <laughs> Took the violations off, don't, don't get me up. So yeah, it, like I said, you can do one, two, three at a time as they come up to get that immunity. The staff is phenomenal. With all four of them. If there's, a, you know, if there's something that they have a question on, they'll ask it. Hey, can you fix this for me? Okay. Yeah, so they're really helpful, and that's you know, the best thing of this program is that, that sort of immunity. If you're, like I said, the stuff that I talked about earlier, and you're like, mm, I'm not sure, look at an audit. That at least gives you some coverage. So I think that's great. All right. Yes, sir. So what drives an audit other than if an A lot of times it's uh, they've got to change the staff if there's some particular regulations or maybe out of permit. Um, and you just have that question of like, are we doing everything right? So you're talking about internal audits within the company? Yes. Not generated by the company? Correct. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, you can do it within the company. You can get somebody in to do it. And it just depends on you know, what, what your scope's going to be and how you want to do it. Yeah. So if you have the staff that's Texas offer, and this may be a more of a federal question, but, um, is there an agency that will come in like OSHA, EPA, and do an audit? That's, I'd say, free. I'll throw that word out there. Uh, I know in Michigan, there's a woman I work with who's from Michigan. Evidently, they have a program like that up there. I didn't know if that existed in Texas or not. Do you know anything? We do have a 